This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kevin Laverne. Bullfinch's Mythology The Age of Fable by Thomas Bullfinch. Chapter 21 Bacchus Ariadne. Bacchus. Bacchus was the son of Jupiter and Semele. Juno, to gratify her resentment against Semele, contrived a plan for her destruction. Assuming the form of Bero, her aged nurse, she insinuated doubts whether it was indeed Jove himself who came as a lover. Heaving a sigh, she said, I hope it will turn out so, but I can't help being afraid. People are not always what they pretend to be. If he is indeed Jove, make him give some proof of it. Ask him to come arrayed in all his splendors, such as he wears in heaven. That will put the matter beyond a doubt. Simile was persuaded to try the experiment. She asks a favor without naming what it is. Jove gives his promise, and confirms it with irrevocable oath attesting the river Styx, terrible to the gods themselves. Then she made known her request. The god would have stopped her as she spake, but she was too quick for him. The words escaped, and he could neither unsay his promise nor her request. In deep distress he left her and returned to the upper regions. There he clothed himself in his splendors, not putting on all his terrors, as when he overthrew the giants, but what is known among the gods as his lesser panoply. Arrayed in this, he entered the chamber of Semele. Her mortal frame could not endure the splendors of the immortal radiance. She was consumed to ashes. Jove took the infant Bacchus and gave him in charge to the Nicene nymphs, who nourished his infancy and childhood, and for their care were rewarded by Jupiter by being placed as the Hyades among the stars. When Bacchus grew up, he discovered the culture of the vine, and the mode of extracting its precious juice. But Juno struck him with madness, and drove him forth a wanderer through various parts of the earth. In Phrygia the goddess Rhea cured him and taught him her religious rites, and he set out on a progress through Asia, teaching the people the cultivation of the vine. The most famous part of his wanderings is his expedition to India, which is said to have lasted several years. Returning in triumph, he undertook to introduce his worship into Greece, but was opposed by some princes, who dreaded its introduction on account of the disorders and madness it brought with it. As he approached his native city Thebes, Pentheus the king, who had no respect for the new worship, forbade its rites to be performed. But when it was known that Bacchus was advancing, men and women, but chiefly the latter, young and old, poured forth to meet him and to join his triumphal march. Mr. Longfellow, in his Drinking Song, thus describes the march of Bacchus. Fawns with youthful Bacchus follow, ivy crowns that brow supernal, as the forehead of Apollo, and possessing youth eternal. Round about him fair Bacchantes, bearing cymbals, flutes, and thyrses, while from Naxian groves of Zante's vineyards sing delirious verses. It was in vain Pentheus remonstrated, commanded, and threatened. Go, said he to his attendants, seize this vagabond leader of the rout, and bring him to me. I will soon make him confess his false claim of heavenly parentage, and renounce his counterfeit worship. It was in vain his nearest friends and wisest counsellors remonstrated and begged him not to oppose the god. Their remonstrances only made him more violent. But now the attendants returned, whom he had dispatched to seize Bacchus. They had been driven away by the Bacchanals, but had succeeded in taking one of them prisoner, whom, with his hands tied behind him, they brought before the king. Pentheus, beholding him with wrathful countenance, said, Fellow, 
you shall speedily be put to death, that your fate may be a warning to others. But though I grudge the delay of your punishment, speak, tell us who you are, and what are these new rites you presume to celebrate. The prisoner, unterrified, responded, My name is Achates. My country is Maonia. My parents were poor people, who had no fields or flocks to leave me. But they left me their fishing rods and nets, and their fishermen's trade. This I followed for some time, till growing weary of remaining in one place, I learned the pilot's art and how to guide my course by the stars. It happened, as I was sailing for Delos, we touched at the island of Dia and went ashore. Next morning I sent the men for fresh water, and myself mounted the hill to observe the wind. When my men returned, bringing with them a prize, as they thought, a boy of delicate appearance, whom they had found asleep. They judged he was a noble youth, perhaps a king's son, and they might get a liberal ransom for him. I observed his dress, his walk, his face. There was something in them which I felt sure was more than mortal. I said to my men, What god there is concealed in that form I know not, but some one there certainly is. Pardon us, gentle deity, for the violence we have done you, and give success to our undertakings. Dictus, one of my best hands for climbing the mast and coming down by the ropes, and Melanthus, my steersman, and Epopius, the leader of the sailors' cry, one and all exclaimed, Spare your prayers for us. So blind is the lust of gain. When they proceeded to put him on board, I resisted them. This ship shall not be profaned by such impiety, said I. I have a greater share in her than any of you. But Lycabus, a turbulent fellow, seized me by the throat, and attempted to throw me overboard, and I scarcely saved myself by clinging to the ropes. The rest approved the deed. Then Bacchus, for it was indeed he, as if shaking off his drowsiness, exclaimed, What are you doing with me? What is this fighting about? Who brought me here? Where are you going to carry me? One of them replied, Fear nothing. Tell us where you wish to go, and we will take you there. Noxos is my home, said Bacchus. Take me there, and you shall be well rewarded. They promised so to do, and told me to pilot the ship to Noxos. Noxos lay to the right, and I was trimming the sails to carry us there, when some by signs and others by whispers signified to me their will that I should sail in the opposite direction and take the boy to Egypt to sell him for a slave. I was confounded and said, Let someone else pilot the ship, withdrawing myself from any further agency in their wickedness. They cursed me, and one of them exclaiming, Don't flatter yourself that we depend on you for our safety, took any place as pilot, and bore away from Naxos. Then the god, pretending that he had just become aware of their treachery, looked out over the sea and said in a voice of weeping, Sailors, these are not the shores you promised to take me to. Yonder island is not my home. What have I done that you should treat me so? It is small glory that you will gain by cheating a poor boy. I wept to hear him, but the crew laughed at both of us, and sped the vessel fast over the sea. All at once, strange as it may seem, it is true, the vessel stopped, in the mid-sea, as fast as if it was fixed on the ground. The men, astonished, pulled at their oars and spread more sail, trying to make progress by the aid of both, but all in vain. Ivy twined around the oars and hindered their motion, and clung to the sails with heavy clusters of berries. A vine, laden with grapes, ran up the mast and along the sides of the vessel. The sound of flutes was heard, and the odor of fragrant wine spread all around. The god himself had a chaplet of vine leaves, and bore in his hand a spear wreathed with ivy. Tigers crouched at his feet, and forms of lynxes and spotted panthers played around him. The men were seized with terror or madness. Some leaped overboard. Others, preparing to do the same, beheld their companions in the water undergoing a change, their bodies becoming flattened and ending in a crooked tail. One exclaimed, What miracle is this? And as he spoke, his mouth widened, his nostrils expanded, and scales covered all his body. Another, endeavoring to pull the oar, felt his hands shrink up and presently to be no longer hands but fins. Another, trying to raise his arms by a rope, found he had no arms, and, curving his mutilated body, jumped into the sea. 
what had been his legs became the two ends of a crescent-shaped tail. The whole crew became dolphins and swam about the ship, now upon the surface, now under it, scattering the spray and spouting the water from their broad nostrils. Of twenty men I alone was left. Trembling with fear, the god cheered me. Fear not, said he, steer toward Naxos. I obeyed, and when we arrived there I kindled the altars and celebrated the sacred rites of Bacchus. Pentheus here exclaimed, we have wasted time enough on this silly story. Take him away and have him executed without delay. Achates was led away by the attendants and shut up fast in prison. But while they were getting ready the instruments of execution, the prison doors came open of their own accord and the chains fell from his limbs, and when they looked for him he was nowhere to be found. Pentheus would take no warning, but instead of sending others, determined to go himself to the scene of the solemnities. The mountain Kitharon was all alive with worshippers, and the cries of the Bacchanals resounded on every side. The noise roused the anger of Pentheus, as the sound of a trumpet does the fire of a war-horse. He penetrated through the wood, and reached an open space where the chief scene of the orgies met his eyes. At the same moment the women saw him, and first among them his own mother Agave, blinded by the god, cried out, See there the wild boar, the hugest monster that prowls in these woods. Come on, sisters, I will be the first to strike the wild boar. The whole band rushed upon him, and while he now talks less arrogantly, now excuses himself, and now confesses his crime and implores pardon, they press upon him and wound him. In vain he cries to his aunts to protect him from his mother. Altano seized one arm, Eno the other, and between them he was torn to pieces, while his mother shouted, Victory! Victory! We have done it! The glory is ours! So the worship of Bacchus was established in Greece. There is an allusion to the story of Bacchus and the mariners in Milton's Comus at line 46. The story of Circe will be found in chapter 29. Bacchus, that first from out the purple grapes, crushed the sweet poison of misused wine, after the Tuscan manners transformed, coasting the Terhene shore as the winds listed, on Circe's island fell, who knows not Circe, the daughter of the sun? Whose charmed cup, whoever tasted, lost his upright shape, and downward fell into a groveling swine. Ariadne We have seen in the story of Theseus how Ariadne, the daughter of King Minos, after helping Theseus to escape from the labyrinth, was carried by him to the island of Naxos, and was left there asleep while the ungrateful Theseus pursued his way home without her. Ariadne, on waking and finding herself deserted, abandoned herself to grief. But Venus took pity on her, and consoled her with the promise that she should love an immortal lover instead of the mortal one she had lost. The island where Ariadne was left was the favorite island of Bacchus, the same that he wished the Turhenian marriers to carry him to, when they so treacherously attempted to make prize of him. As Ariadne sat lamenting her fate, Bacchus found her, consoled her, and made her his wife. As a marriage present he gave her a golden crown, enriched with gems, and when she died he took her crown and threw it up into the sky. As it mounted, the gems grew brighter and were turned into stars, and preserving its form, Ariadne's crown remains fixed in the heavens as a constellation, between the kneeling Hercules and the man who holds the serpent. Spencer alludes to Ariadne's crown, though he has made some mistakes in his mythology. It was at the wedding of Pirithus, and not Theseus, that the centaurs and Lapithae quarreled. Look how the crown which Ariadne wore upon her ivory forehead that same day, that Theseus her unto his bridal bore, then the bold centaurs made that bloody fray with the fierce Lapiths which did them dismay. Being now placed in the firmament, through the bright heaven doth her beams display, and is unto the stars an ornament, which round about her move in order excellent. End of chapter 21
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Patty Marie in Istanbul. Bullfinch's Mythology The Age of Fable by Thomas Bullfinch. Chapter 22. The rural deities, Erisichthon, Rhecus, the water deities, Camenae, winds. The rural deities, Pan, the god of wood and fields, of flocks and shepherds, dwelt in grottoes, wandered on the mountains and in valleys, and amused himself with the chase, or in leading the dances of the nymphs. He was fond of music, and, as we have seen, the inventor of the syrinx, or shepherd's pipe, which he himself played in a masterly manner. Pan, like other gods who dwelt in forests, was dreaded by those whose occupations caused them to pass through woods by night, for the gloom and loneliness of such scenes disposed the mind to superstitious fears. Hence sudden fright, without any visible cause, was ascribed to Pan, and called panic terror. As the name of the god signifies all, Pan came to be considered a symbol of the universe and personification of nature and later still to be regarded as a representative of all the gods and of heathenism itself. Sylvanus and Faunus were Latin deities whose characteristics were so nearly the same as those of Pan that we may safely consider them as the same personage under different names. The wood nymphs Pan's partners in the dance were but one class of nymphs. There were beside them the naiads, who presided over brooks and fountains, the oreads, nymphs of mountains and grottoes, and the nereids, sea nymphs. The three last named were immortal, but the wood nymphs, called dryads or hamadryads, were believed to perish with the trees which had been their abode, and with which they had come into existence. It was therefore an impious act to wantonly destroy a tree, and in some aggravated cases were severely punished, as in the instance of Erisichthon, which we are about to record. Milton, in his glowing description of early creation, thus alludes to Pan as the personification of nature. Universal Pan, knit with the graces and the hours in dance, led on the eternal spring. And describing Eve's abode, in shadier bower, more sacred or sequestered, though but feigned, Pan or Sylvanus never slept, nor nymph nor faunus haunted. Paradise Lost, Book Four. It was a pleasing trait in the old paganism that it loved to trace in every operation of nature the agency of deity. The imagination of the Greeks peopled the regions of earth and sea with divinities, to whose agency it attributed those phenomena which our philosophy ascribes to the operation of the laws of nature. Sometimes in our poetical moods we feel disposed to regret the change, and to think that the heart has lost as much as the head has gained by the substitution. The poet Wordsworth thus strongly expresses this sentiment. Great God, I'd rather be a pagan, suckled in a creed outworn. So might I, standing on this pleasant lea, have glimpses that would make me less forlorn, have sight of Proteus rising from the sea, and hear old Triton blow his wreathed horn. Schiller, in his poem, De Gotter Griechenlands 
expresses his regret for the overthrow of the beautiful mythology of ancient times in a way that has called forth an answer from a Christian poet, Mrs. E. Barrett Browning, in her poem called The Dead Pan. The two following verses are a specimen. By your beauty which confesses some chief beauty conquering you, by our grand heroic guesses through your falsehood at the true. We will weep not. Earth shall roll heir to each god's aureole, and Pan is dead. Earth outgrows the mythic fancies sung beside her in her youth, and those debonair romances sound but dull beside the truth. Phoebus' chariot course is run. Look up, poets, to the sun. Pan, Pan is dead. These lines are founded on an early Christian tradition that when the heavenly host told the shepherds at Bethlehem of the birth of Christ, a deep groan heard through all the isles of Greece told that great Pan was dead and that all the royalty of Olympus was dethroned, and the several deities were sent wandering in cold and darkness. So Milton, in his hymn on the Nativity, The lonely mountains o'er, and the resounding shore, A voice of weeping heard, and loud lament. From haunted spring and dale, edged with poplar pale, The parting genius is with sighing sent. With flower in woven tresses torn, the nymphs in twilight shade of tangled thickets mourn. Erisichthon Erisichthon was a profane person and a despiser of the gods. On one occasion he presumed to violate with the axe a grove sacred to Ceres. There stood in this grove a venerable oak, so large that it seemed a wood in itself, its ancient trunk towering aloft, whereon votive garlands were often hung, and inscriptions carved expressing the gratitude of suppliants to the nymph of the tree. Often had the dryads danced round it hand in hand, its trunk measured fifteen cubits round, and it overtopped the other trees as they overtopped the shrubbery. But for all that, Erisichthon saw no reason why he should spare it, and he ordered his servants to cut it down. When he saw them hesitate, he snatched an axe from one, and thus impiously exclaimed, I care not whether it be a tree beloved of the goddess or not. If it were the goddess herself, it should come down if it stood in my way. And so saying, he lifted the axe, and the oak seemed to shudder and utter a groan. When the first blow fell upon the trunk, blood flowed from the wound. All the bystanders were horror-struck, and one of them ventured to remonstrate and hold back the fatal axe. Erisichthon, with a scornful look, said to him, Receive the reward of your piety, and turned against him the weapon which he had held aside from the tree, gashed his body with many wounds, and cut off his head. Then from the midst of the oak came a voice. I who dwell in this tree am a nymph, beloved of Ceres, and dying by your hands forewarn you that punishment awaits you. He desisted not from his crime, and at last the tree, sundered by repeated blows and drawn by ropes, fell with a crash and prostrated a great part of the grove in its fall. The dryads, in dismay at the loss of their companion, and seeing the pride of the forest laid low, went in a body to Ceres, all clad in garments of mourning, and invoked punishment upon Erisichthon. She nodded her assent, and as she bowed her head, the grain ripe for harvest in the laden fields bowed also. 
She planned a punishment so dire that one would pity him if such a culprit as he could be pitied. To deliver him over to famine. As Ceres herself could not approach famine, for the fates have ordained that these two goddesses should never come together. She called an oread from her mountain and spoke to her in these words. There is a place in the farthest part of ice-clad Scythia, a sad and sterile region without trees and without crops. Cold dwells there, and fear and shuddering and famine. Go and tell the last to take possession of the bowels of Erisichthon. Let not abundance subdue her, nor the power of my gifts drive her away. Be not alarmed at the distance, for famine dwells very far from Ceres. But take my chariot. The dragons are fleet and obey the rain, and will take you through the air in a short time. So she gave her the reins, and she drove away and soon reached Scythia. On arriving at Mount Caucasus, she stopped the dragons and found famine in a stony field, pulling up with teeth and claws the scanty herbage. Her hair was rough, her eyes sunk, her face pale, her lips blanched, her jaws covered with dust, and her skin drawn tight so as to show all her bones. As the Oread saw her afar off, for she did not dare come near, she delivered the commands of Ceres, and though she stopped as short a time as possible, and kept her distance as well as she could, yet she began to feel hungry and turned the dragon's heads, and drove back to Thessaly. Famine obeyed the commands of Ceres, and sped through the air to the dwelling of Erisichthon, entered the chamber of the guilty man, and found him asleep. She enfolded him with her wings, and breathed herself into him, infusing her poison into his veins. Having discharged her task, she hastened to leave the land of plenty, and returned to her accustomed haunts. Erisichthon still slept, and in his dreams craved food, and moved his jaws as if eating. When he awoke, his hunger was raging. Without a moment's delay he would have food set before him, of whatever kind earth, sea, or air produces, and complained of hunger even while he ate. What would have sufficed for a city or a nation was not enough for him. The more he ate, the more he craved. His hunger was like the sea which receives all the rivers, yet is never filled, or like fire which burns all the fuel that is heaped upon it, yet is still voracious for more. His property rapidly diminished under the unceasing demands of his appetite, but his hunger continued unabated. At length he had spent all and had only his daughter left, a daughter worthy of a better parent. Her too he sold. She scorned to be the slave of a purchaser, and as she stood by the seaside raised her hands in prayer to Neptune. He heard her prayer, and though her new master was not far off and had his eye upon her a moment before, Neptune changed her form and made her assume that of a fisherman, busy at his occupation. Her master, looking for her and seeing her in her altered form, addressed her and said, Good fisherman, Whither went the maiden whom I saw just now, with hair disheveled and in humble garb, standing about where you stand? Tell me truly, so may your luck be good, and not a fish nibble at your hook and get away. She perceived that her prayer was answered, and rejoiced inwardly at hearing herself inquired of about herself. 
She replied, Pardon me, stranger, but I have been so intent upon my line that I have seen nothing else. But I wish I may never catch another fish if I believe any woman or other person except myself to have been hereabouts for some time. He was deceived and went his way, thinking that his slave had escaped. When she resumed her own form, her father was well pleased to find her still with him, and the money, too, that he got by the sale of her. So he sold her again. But she was changed by the favor of Neptune as often as she was sold, now into a horse, now a bird, now an ox, now a stag, got away from her purchasers, and came home. And by this base method the starving father pre procured food, but not enough for his wants, and at last hunger compelled him to devour his limbs, and he strove to nourish his body by eating his body, till death relieved him from the vengeance of Ceres. Rhecus The Hamadryads could appreciate services as well as punish injuries. The story of Rhecus proves this. Rhecus happened to see an oak just ready to fall, ordered his servants to prop it up. The nymph, who had been on the point of perishing with the tree, came and expressed her gratitude to him for having saved her life, and bade him ask what reward he would. Rhecus boldly asked her love, and the nymph yielded to his desire. She at the same time charged him to be constant, and told him that a bee should be her messenger, and let him know when she would admit his society. One time the bee came to Rhecus as he was playing at draughts, and he carelessly brushed it away. This so incensed the nymph that she deprived him of sight. Our countryman, J. R. Lowell, has taken this story for the subject of one of his shorter poems. He introduces it thus. Hear now this fairy legend of old Greece, as full of freedom, youth, and beauty still, as the immortal freshness of that grace, carved for all ages on some attic frieze. THE WATER DEITIES Oceanus and Tethys were the titans who ruled over the watery element. When Jove and his brothers overthrew the titans and assumed their power, Neptune and Amphitrite succeeded to the dominion of the waters in place of Oceanus and Tethys. Neptune Neptune was the chief of the water deities. The symbol of his power was the trident, or spear, with three points, with which he used to shatter rocks, to call forth or subdue storms, to shake the shores, and the like. He created the horse, and was the patron of horse races. His own horse had brazen hoofs and golden manes. They drew his chariot over the sea, which became smooth before him while the monsters of the deep gambled about his path. Amphitrite Amphitrite was the wife of Neptune. She was the daughter of Nereus and Doris, and the mother of Triton. Neptune, to pay his court to Amphitrite, came riding on a dolphin. Having won her, he rewarded the dolphin by placing him among the stars. Nereus and Doris Nereus and Doris are the parents of the Nereids, the most celebrated of whom are Amphitrite, Thetis, the mother of Achilles, and Galatea, who was loved by the Cyclops Polyphemus. Nereus was distinguished for his knowledge and his love of truth and justice, whence he was termed an elder. The gift of prophecy was also assigned to him. Triton and Proteus 
Triton was the son of Neptune and Amphitrite, and the poets make him his father's trumpeter. Proteus was also a son of Neptune. He, like Nereus, is styled a sea elder for his wisdom and knowledge of future events. His peculiar power was that of changing his shape at will. Thetis. Thetis, the daughter of Nereus and Doris, was so beautiful that Jupiter himself sought her in marriage. But having learned from Prometheus the Titan that Thetis should bear a son who should grow greater than his father, Jupiter desisted from his suit and decreed that Thetis should be the wife of a mortal. By the aid of Chiron, the centaur, Peleus succeeded in winning the goddess for his bride, and their son was the renowned Achilles. In our chapter on the Trojan War, it will appear that Thetis was a faithful mother to him, aiding him in all difficulties and watching over his interests from the first to the last. Leucothea and Palaemon I know the daughter of Cadmus and wife of Athamas, flying from her frantic husband with her little son Melisertes in her arms, sprang from a cliff into the sea. The gods, out of compassion, made her a goddess of the sea under the name of Leucothea, and him a god under that of Palaemon. Both were held powerful to save from shipwreck and invoked by sailors. Palaemon was usually represented riding on a dolphin. The Isthmian games were celebrated in his honor. He was called Portunus by the Romans, and believed to have jurisdiction of the ports and shores. Milton alludes to all these deities in the song at the conclusion of Comus. Sabrina fair, listen and appear to us, in name of great Oceanus, by the earth-shaking Neptune's mace, and Tethys' grave majestic pace, by hoary Nereus' wrinkled look, and the Carpathian wizard's hook, by scaly Triton's winding shell, and old soothsaying Glaucus' spell, by Leucothea's lovely hands, and her son who rules the strands, by Thetis' tinsel-slippered feet, and the songs of sirens sweet. Armstrong, the poet of the art of preserving health, under the inspiration of Hygieia, the goddess of health, thus celebrates the naiads. Pian is the name of both, Apollo and Esculapius. Come ye naiads to the fountain's lead, propitious maids. The task remains to sing your gifts. So pean, so the powers of health command, to praise your crystal element. O comfortable streams, with eager lips and trembling hands, the languid thirsty quaff new life in you. Fresh vigor fills their veins. No warmer cups the rural ages knew, none warmer sought the sires of humankind. Happy in temperate peace their equal days felt not the alternate fits of feverish mirth and sick dejection. Still serene and pleased, blessed with divine immunity from ills, long centuries they lived, their only fate was ripe old age, and rather sleep than death. The Camini By this name the Latins designated the Muses, but included under it some other deities, principally nymphs of fountains. Egeria was one of them, whose fountain and grotto are still shown. It was said that Numa, 
the second king of Rome was favored by this nymph with secret interviews in which she taught him those lessons of wisdom and of law which he embodied in the institutions of his rising nation. After the death of Numa, the nymph pined away and was changed into a fountain. Byron, in Child Harold, Canto Four, thus alludes to Egeria and her grotto. Here didst thou dwell in this enchanted cover, Egeria, all thy heavenly bosom beating for the far footsteps of thy mortal lover. The purple midnight veiled that mystic meeting with her most starry canopy. Tennyson also, in his Palace of Art, gives us a glimpse of the royal lover expecting the interview. Holding one hand against his ear to list a footfall, ere he saw the wood-nymph, stayed the Tuscan king to hear of wisdom and of law. The winds. When so many less active agencies were personified, it is not to be supposed that the winds failed to be so. They were Boreas or Aquilo, the north wind, Zephyrus or Favonius, the west, Notus or Auster, the south, and Eurus, the east. The first two have been chiefly celebrated by the poets, the former as a type of rudeness and the latter of gentleness. Boreas loved the nymph, Orithea, and tried to play the lover's part, but met with poor success. It was hard for him to breathe gently, and sighing was out of the question. Weary at last of fruitless endeavors, he acted true to his character, seized the maiden, and carried her off. Their children were Zetes and Calais, winged warriors who accompanied the Argonautic expedition and did good service in an encounter with those monstrous birds, the harpies. Zephyrus was the lover of Flora. Milton alludes to them in Paradise Lost, where he describes Adam waking and contemplating Eve still asleep. He on his side, leaning half-raised with looks of cordial love, hung over her enamored and beheld beauty, which, whether waking or asleep, shot forth peculiar graces. Then with voice, mild as Zephyrus on Flora breathes, her hand soft touching, whispered thus, Awake, my fairest, my espoused, my latest found, heaven's last best gift, my ever new delight. Dr. Young, the poet of the Night Thoughts, addressing the idle and luxurious, says, Ye delicate, who nothing can support, yourselves most insupportable, for whom the winter rose must blow, and silky soft Favonius breathe still softer, or be chid. End of chapter 22、The、LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Thomas Wells. Bullfinch's Mythology The Age of Fable by Thomas Bullfinch. Chapter 23 Achilles and Hercules. The river god Achilles. Told the story of e r i s c h r i s t o n to Theseus and his companions, whom he was entertaining at his hospitable board, while they were delayed on their journey by the overflow of his waters. Having finished his story, he added, But why should I tell of other persons' transformations when I myself am an instance of the possession of this power? Sometimes I become a serpent, and sometimes a bull, with horns on my head. Or should I say, I once could do so? But now I have but one horn, having lost one. And here he groaned and was silent. 
Theseus asked him the cause of his grief, and how he lost his horn, to which question the river god replies as follows. Who likes to tell of his defeats? Yet I will not hesitate to relate mine, comforting myself with the thought of the greatness of my conqueror, for it was Hercules. Perhaps you have heard of the fame of Dejanira, the fairest of maidens, whom a host of suitors strove to win. Hercules and myself were of the number, and the rest yielded to us too. He urged in his behalf his descent from Jove and his labors by which he had exceeded the exactions of Juno, his stepmother. I, on the other hand, said to the father of the maiden, Behold me, the king of the waters that flow through your land. I am no stranger from a foreign shore, but belong to the country, a part of your realm. Let it not stand in my way that royal Juno owes me no enmity, nor punishes me with heavy tasks. As for this man, who boasts himself the son of Jove, it is either a false pretense, or disgraceful to him if true, for it cannot be true except by his mother's shame. As I said this, Hercules scowled upon me, and with difficulty restrained his rage. My hand will answer better than my tongue, said he. I yield to you the victory in words, but trust my cause to the strife of deeds. With that he advanced towards me, and I was ashamed, after what I had said, to yield. I threw off my green vesture and presented myself for the struggle. He tried to throw me, now attacking my head, now my body. My bulk was my protection, and he assailed me in vain. For a time we stopped, then returned to the conflict. We each kept our position, determined not to yield. Foot to foot, I bending over him, clenching his hand in mine, with my forehead almost touching his. Thrice Hercules tried to throw me off, and the fourth time he succeeded, brought me to the ground and himself upon my back. I tell you the truth, it was as if a mountain had fallen on me. I struggled to get my arms at liberty, panting and reeking with perspiration. He gave me no chance to recover, but seized my throat. My knees were on the earth and my mouth in the dust. Finding that I was no match for him in the warrior's art, I resorted to others and glided away in the form of a serpent. I curled my body in a coil and hissed at him with my forked tongue. He smiled scornfully at this, and said, It was the labor of my infancy to conquer snakes. So saying, he clasped my neck with his hands. I was almost choked, and struggled to get my neck out of his grasp. Vanquished in this form, I tried what alone remained to me, and assumed the form of a bull. He grasped my neck with his arm, and dragging my head down to the ground, overthrew me on the sand. Nor was this enough. His ruthless hand rent my horn from my head. The Naiades took it, consecrated it, and filled it with fragrant flowers. Plenty adopted my horn and made it her own, and called it Cornucopia. The ancients were fond of finding hidden meaning in their mythological tales. They explained this fight of Achilos with Hercules by saying Achilos was a river that in seasons of rain overflowed its banks. When the fable says that Achilos loved de Genera, and sought a union with her, the meaning is that the river in its windings flowed through part of Dejanera's kingdom. It is said to take the form of a snake because of its winding, and of a bull because it made a brawling or roaring in its course. When the river swelled, it made itself another channel. Thus its head was horned. Hercules prevented the return of these periodical overflows by embankments and canals, and therefore he was said to have vanquished the river god and cut off his horn. Finally, the lands formerly subject to overflow, but now redeemed, became very fertile and this is meant by the horn of plenty. There is another account of the origin of the cornucopia. Jupiter at his birth was committed by his mother Rhea to the care of the daughters of Melissius, a Cretan king. They fed the infant deity with the milk of the goat Almathia. Jupiter broke off one of the horns of the goat and gave it to his nurses, and endowed it with the wonderful power of becoming fulfilled with whatever the possessor might wish. The name of Almathia is also given by some writers to the mother of Bacchus. It is thus used by Milton, Paradise Lost, Book 4. That Nyesian isle, girt with the river Triton, where old Cham, whose Gentiles Ammon call, and Limian Jove, hid Almathia and her florid son, young Bacchus, from his stepdame Rhea's eye. Admetus and Alcestis Aesculapius, the son of Apollo, was endowed by his father with such skill in the healing art that he even restored the dead to life. At this Pluto took alarm, and prevailed on Jupiter to launch a thunderbolt at Aesculapius. Apollo was indignant at the destruction of his son, and wreaked his vengeance on the innocent workmen who had made the thunderbolt. These were the Cyclopses, who had their workshop under Mount Aetna, from which the smoke and flames of their furnaces are constantly issuing. Apollo shot his arrows at the Cyclopses, which so incensed Jupiter that he condemned him as a punishment to become the servant of the mortal for the space of one year. 
Accordingly Apollo went into the service of Admetus, king of Thessaly, and pastured his flocks for him on the verdant banks of the river Amphirosos. Admetus was a suitor, with others, for the hand of Alcestis, the daughter of Phileus, who promised her to him who should come for her in the chariot drawn by lions and boars. This task Admetus performed by the assistance of his divine herdsmen, and was made happy in the possession of Alcestis. But Admetus fell ill, and being near to death, Apollo prevailed on the fates to spare him on condition that some one would consent to die in his stead. Admetus, in his joy at this reprieve, thought little of the ransom, and perhaps remembering the declarations of attachment which he had often heard from his courtiers and dependents, fancied that it would be easy to find a substitute. But it was not so. Brave warriors, who would willingly have perilled their lives for their prince, shrunk from the thought of dying for him on the bed of sickness. And old servants, who had experienced his bounty, and that of his house, from their childhood up, were not willing to lay down the scanty remnant of their days to show their gratitude. Men asked, Why does not one of his own parents do it? They cannot in the course of nature live much longer, and who can feel like them the call to rescue the life they gave from an untimely end? But the parents, distressed though they were at the thought of losing him, shrunk from the call. Then Alcestis, with a generous self-devotion, proffered herself as the substitute. Admetus, fond as he was of life, would not have submitted to receive it at such a cost. But there was no remedy. The condition imposed by the fates had been met, and the decree was irrevocable. Alcestis sickened as Admetus revived, and she was rapidly sinking into the grave. Just at this time Hercules arrived at the palace of Admetus, and found all the inmates in great distress for the impending loss of the devoted wife and beloved mistress. Hercules, to whom no labor was too arduous, resolved to attempt her rescue. He went and lay in wait at the door of the chamber of the dying queen, and when death came for his prey he seized him and forced him to resign his victim. Alcestis recovered and was restored to her husband. Milton alludes to the story of Alcestis in his sonnet On His Deceased Wife. Methought I saw my late Ispau's saint brought to me like Alcestis from the grave, whom Jove's great son to her glad husband gave, rescued from death by force, though pale and faint. J. R. Lowe has chosen the shepherd of King Admetus for the subject of his short poem. He makes that event the first introduction of poetry to men. Men called him but a shiftless youth, in whom no good they saw, and yet unwittingly, in truth, they made his careless words their law, and day by day more holy grew each spot where he had trod, till after poets only knew their first-born brother was a god. Antigon A large proportion of both the interesting persons and of the exalted acts of legendary Greece belongs to the female sex. Antigon was as bright an example of filial and sisterly fidelity as was Alcestis of connubial devotion. She was the daughter of Oedipus and Jocasta, who with all their descendants were the victims of an unrelenting fate, dooming them to destruction. Oedipus, in his madness, had torn out his eyes, and was driven forth from his kingdom Thebes, dreaded and abandoned by all men as an object of divine vengeance. Antigon, his daughter, alone shared his wanderings, and remained with him till he died, and then returned to Thebes. Her brothers, Atocles and Polynices, had agreed to share the kingdom between them, and reigned alternatively year by year. The first year fell to the lot of Eteocles, who, when his time expired, refused to surrender the kingdom to his brother. Polynices fled to Adrastus, king of Argos, who gave him his daughter in marriage, and aided him with an army to enforce his claim to the kingdom. This led to the celebrated expedition of the Seven Against Thebes, which furnished ample materials for the epic and tragic poets of Greece. Amphiarius, the brother-in-law of Adrestus, opposed the enterprise, for he was a soothsayer, and knew by his art that no one of the leaders except Adrastus would live to return. But Amphiarius, on his marriage to Eraphiel, the king's sister, had agreed that whenever he and Adrastus should differ in opinion, the decision should be left to Raphael. Polynices, knowing this, gave Eraphiel the color of Harmonia, and thereby gained her to his interest. This collar or necklace was a present which Vulcan had given to Harmonia on her marriage with Cadmus, and Polynices had taken it with him on his flight from Thebes. Eraphiel could not resist so tempting a bribe, and by her decision the war was resolved on, and Ampharius went to his certain fate. He bore his prass bravely in the contest, but could not avert his destiny. 
Pursued by the enemy, he fled along the river, when a thunderbolt launched by Jupiter opened the ground, and he, his chariot, and his charioteer were swallowed up. It would have not been in a place here to detail all the acts of heroism or atrocity which marked the contest, but we must not omit to record the fidelity of Edin as an upset to the weakness of Eriphil. Capanius, the husband of Adenine, in the, order, in the ardor of the fight declared that he would force his way into the city in spite of Jove himself. Placing a ladder against the wall he mounted, but Jupiter, offended at his impious language, struck him with a thunderbolt. When his obsequies were celebrated, Evadne cast herself on his funeral pile and perished. Early in the contest, Etocles consulted the soothsayer Tiresias as to the issue. Tiresias, in his youth, had by chance seen Minerva bathing. The goddess in her wrath deprived him of his sight, but afterwards relenting, gave him in compensation the knowledge of future events. When consulted by Etocles, he declared that victory should fall to Thebes if Minosius, the son of Creon, gave himself a voluntary victim. The heroic youth, learning the response, threw away his life in the first encounter. The siege continued long, with various successes. At length both hosts agreed that brothers should decide their quarrel by single combat. They fought and fell by each other's hands. The armies then renewed the fight, and at last the invaders were forced to yield, and fled, leaving their dead unburied. Creon, the uncle of the fallen princes, now became king, caused Eteocles to be buried with distinguished honor, but suffered the body of Polynices to lie where it fell, forbidding every one on pain of death to give it burial. Antigone, the sister of Polynices, heard with indignation the revolting edict which consigned her brother's body to the dogs and vultures, de depriving it of the rights which were considered essential to the repose of the dead. Unmoved by the dissuading counsel of an affectionate but timid sister, and unable to procure assistance, she determined to brave the hazard, and to bury the body with her own hands. She was detected in the act, and Creon gave orders that she should be buried alive, as having deliberately set at naught the solemn edict of the city. Her lover, Haemon, the son of Creon, unable to avert her fate, would not survive her, and fell by his own hand. Antigone forms the subject of two fine tragedies of the Grecian poet Sophocles. Miss Jameson, in her Characteristics of Women, has compared her character with that of Cordelia, in Shakespeare's King Lear. The perusal of her remarks cannot fail to gratify our readers. The following is the lamentation of Antigone over Oedipus, when death has at last relieved him from his sufferings. Alas! I only wished I might have died with my poor father. Wherefore I should I ask for longer life? Oh, I was fond of misery with him, in what was most unlovely grew beloved when he was with me. O oh, my dearest father, beneath the earth now in deep darkness hid, worn as thou wert with age, to me thou still wast dear, and shalt be ever. Franklin's Sophocles Penelope Penelope is another one of those mythic heroines whose beauties were rather those of character and conduct than of person. She was the daughter of Icarus, a Spartan prince. Ulysses, king of Ithaca, sought her in marriage, and won her over all competitors. When the moment came for her the bride to leave her father's house, Icarus, unable to bear the thought of parting with his daughter, tried to persuade her to remain with him, and not accompany her husband to Ithaca. Ulysses gave Penelope her choice, to stay or go with him. Penelope made no reply, but dropped her veil over her face. Icarus urged her no further. But when she was gone, erected a statue to modesty on the spot where they parted. Ulysses and Penelope had not enjoyed their union more than a year when it was interrupted by the events which called Ulysses to the Trojan War. During his long absence, and when it was doubtful whether he still lived, and highly improbable that he would ever return, Penelope was importuned by numerous suitors, from whom there seemed no refuge but in choosing one of them for her husband. Penelope, however, employed every art to gain time, still hoping for Ulysses' return. One of her arts of delay was engaging in the preparation of a robe for the funeral canopy of Laertes, her husband's father. She pledged herself to make her choice among the suitors when the robe was finished. During the day she worked at the robe, but in the night she undid the work of the day. This is the famous Penelope's web, which is used as a proverbial expression for anything which is perpetually doing but never done. The rest of Penelope's history will be told when we give an account of her husband's adventures. End of chapter 23All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Bullfinch's Mythology, The Age of Fable, by Thomas Bullfinch, Chapter 24. Orpheus and Eurydice, Aristeus, Amphion, Linus, Thamyris, Marseus, Melampus, and Musaeus. Orpheus and Eurydice. Orpheus was the son of Apollo and the muse Calliope. He was presented by his father with a lyre, and taught to play upon it, which he did to such perfection that nothing could withstand the charm of his music. Not only his fellow mortals, but wild beasts were softened by his strains, and gathering round him laid by their fierceness, and stood entranced with his lay. Nay, the very trees and rocks were sensible to the charm. The former crowded round him, and the latter relaxed somewhat of their hardness, softened by his notes." Hymen had been called to bless with his presence the nuptials of Orpheus with Eurydice, but though he attended, he brought no happy omens with him. His very torch smoked and brought tears into their eyes. In co coincidence with such prognostics, Eurydice, shortly after her marriage, while wandering with the nymphs, her companions, was seen by the shepherd Aristeus, who was struck with her beauty and made advances to her. She fled, and in flying trod upon a snake in the grass, was bitten in the foot, and died. Orpheus sang his grief to all who breathed the upper air, both gods and men, and finding it all unavailing, resolved to seek his wife in the regions of the dead. He descended by a cave situated on the side of the promontory of Tenaris, and arrived at the Stygian realm. He passed through crowds of ghosts, and presented himself before the throne of Pluto and Proserpine. Accompanying the words with the lyre, he sung, O deities of the underworld, to whom all we who live must come, hear my words, for they are true. I come not to spy out the secrets of Tartarus, nor to try my strength against the three-headed dog with snaky hair who guards the entrance. I came to seek my wife, whose opening years the poisonous viper's fang has brought to an untimely end. Love has led me here, love, a god all-powerful with us who dwell on the earth, and if old traditions say true, not less so here. I implore you by these abodes full of terror, these realms of silence and uncreated things, unite again the thread of Eurydice's life. We all are destined to you, and sooner or later must pass to your domain. She, too, when she shall have fulfilled her term of life, will rightly be yours. But till then grant her to me, I beseech you. If you deny me, I cannot return alone. You shall triumph in the death of us both. As he sang these tender strains, the very ghosts shed tears. Tantalus, in spite of his thirst, stopped for a moment his efforts for water. Ixion's wheels stood still. The vulture ceased to tear the giant's liver. The daughters of Danius rested from their task of drawing water in a sieve. And Sisyphus sat on his rock to listen. Then, for the first time, it is said, the cheeks of the Furies were wet with tears. Proserpine could not resist, and Pluto himself gave way. Eurydice was called. She came from among the new-arrived ghosts, limping with her wounded foot. Orpheus was permitted to take her away with him on one condition, that he should not turn around to look at her till they should have reached the upper air. Under this condition they proceeded on their way, he leading, she following, through passages dark and steep, in total silence, till they had nearly reached the outlet into the cheerful upper world, when Orpheus, in a moment of forgetfulness, to assure himself that she was still following, cast a glance behind him, when instantly she was borne away. Stretching out their arms to embrace each other, they grasped only the air. Dying now a second time, she yet cannot reproach her husband, for how can she blame his impatience to behold her? Farewell, she said, a last farewell, and was hurried away, so fast that the sound hardly reached his ears. Orpheus endeavored to follow her, and besought permission to return and try once more for her release, but the stern ferryman repulsed him and refused passage. Seven days he lingered about the brink, without food or sleep, then bitterly accusing of cruelty the powers of Erebus, he sang his complaints to the rocks and mountains, melting the hearts of tigers and moving the oaks from their stations. He held himself aloof from womankind, dwelling constantly on the recollection of his sad mischance. The Thracian maidens tried their best to captivate him, but he repulsed their advances. They bore with him as long as they could, but finding him insensible one day, excited by the rites of Bacchus, one of them exclaimed, See yonder our despiser, and threw at him her javelin. The weapon, as soon as it came within the sound of his lyre, fell harmless at his feet. So did also the stones that they threw at him. But the women raised a scream and drowned the voice of the music, and then the missiles reached him and soon were stained with his blood. The maniacs tore him limb from limb, and threw his head and his lyre into the river Hebrus, down which they floated, murmuring sad music, to which the shores responded a plaintive symphony. The muses gathered up the fragments of his body and buried them at Liberithria, where the nightingale is said to sing over his grave more sweetly than in any other part of Greece. His lyre was placed by Jupiter among the stars. His shade passed a second time to Tartarus, where he sought out his Eurydice and embraced her with eager arms. 
They roam the happy fields together now, sometimes he leading, sometimes she, and Orpheus gazes as much as he will upon her, no longer incurring a penalty for a thoughtless glance. The story of Orpheus has furnished Pope with an illustration of the power of music. For his ode for St. Cecilia's Day, the following stanza relates the conclusion of the story. But soon, too soon, the lover turns his eyes. Again she falls, again she dies, she dies. How wilt thou know the fatal sisters move? No crime was thine, if it is no crime to love. Now under hanging mountains, besides the falls of fountains, or where Hebrus wanders, rolling in meanders, all alone he makes his moan, and calls her ghost, forever, ever, ever lost. Now with furies surrounded, despairing confounded, he trembles, he glows, amidst Rodope's snows. See, wild as the winds, o'er the desert he flies. Hark, Hamus resounds with the bacchanal's cries. Ah, see, he dies. Yet even in death Eurydice he sung. Eurydice still trembled on his tongue. Eurydice the woods, Eurydice the flocks, Eurydice the rocks, and hollow mountains rung. The superior melody of the nightingale's song over the grave of Orpheus is alluded to by Southey in his Thalaba. Then on his ear what sounds of harmony arose, far music in the distance mellowed song, from bowers of merriment, the waterfall remote, the murmuring of the leafy groves, the single nightingale, perched in the rosier by, so richly toned, that never from that most melodious bird, singing a love-song to his brooding mate, did Thracian shepherd by the grave of Orpheus hear a sweeter melody, though there the spirit of the sepulchre and all his own power infused to swell the incense that he loves." Aristaeus the beekeeper. Man avails himself of the instincts of the inferior animals for his own advantage. Hence sprang the art of keeping bees. Honey must first have been known as a wild product, the bees building their structures in hollow trees or holes in the rocks, or any similar cavity that chance offered. Thus occasionally the carcass of a dead animal would be occupied by the bees for that purpose. It was no doubt from some such incident that the superstition arose that the bees were engendered by the decaying flesh of the animal, and Virgil in the following story shows how this supposed fact may be turned to account for renewing the swarm when it has been lost by disease or accident. Aristaeus, who first taught the management of bees, was the son of the water nymph Cyrene. His bees had perished, and he resorted for aid to his mother. He stood at the riverside and thus addressed her. O oh, mother, the pride of my life is taken from me. I have lost my precious bees. My care and skill have availed me nothing, and you, my mother, have not warded off from me the blow of misfortune. His mother heard these complaints as she sat in her palace at the bottom of the river, with her attendant nymphs around her. They were engaged in female occupations, spinning and weaving, while one told stories to amuse the rest. The sad voice of Aristaeus interrupting their occupation, one of them put her head above the water, and seeing him, returned and gave information to his mother, who ordered that he should be brought into her presence. The river at her command opened itself and let him pass in, while it stood curled like a mountain on either side. He descended to the region where the fountains of the great rivers lie. He saw the enormous receptacles of water, and was almost deafened with the roar, while he surveyed them hurrying off in various directions to water the face of the earth. Arriving at his mother's apartment, he was hospitably received by Cyrene and her nymphs, who spread their table with the richest dainties. They first poured out libations to Neptune, then regaled themselves with the feast, and after that Cyrene thus addressed him. There is an old prophet named Proteus, who dwells in the sea and is a favorite of Neptune, whose herd of sea calves he pastures. We nymphs hold him in great respect, for he is a learned sage and knows all things past, present, and to come. He can tell you, my son, the cause of the mortality among your bees, and how you may remedy it. But he will not do it voluntarily, however you may entreat him. You must compel him by force. If you seize him and chain him, he will answer your questions in order to get released, for he cannot by all his arts get away if you hold him fast in chains. I will carry you to his cave, where he comes at noon to take his midday repose. Then you may easily secure him. But when he finds himself captured, his resort is to a power he possesses of changing himself into various forms. He will become a wild boar or a fierce tiger, a scaly dragon or lion with yellow mane. Or he will make a noise like the crackling of flames or the rush of water, so as to tempt you to let go of the chain, when he will make his escape. But you have only to keep him fast bound, and at last when he finds all his arts unveiling, he will return to his own figure and obey your commands. So saying, she sprinkled her son with fragrant nectar, the beverage of the gods, and immediately an unusual vigor filled his frame, encouraged his heart, while perfume breathed all around him. The nymph led her son to the prophet's cave, and concealed him among the recesses of the rocks, while she herself took her place behind the clouds. When noon came, and the hour when men and herds retreat from the glaring sun to indulge in quiet slumber, Proteus issued from the water, followed by his herd of sea-calves, which spread themselves along the shore. 
He sat on the rock and counted his herd, then stretched himself on the floor of the cave and went to sleep. Aristaeus hardly allowed him to get fairly asleep before he fixed the fetters on him and shouted aloud. Proteus, waking and finding himself captured, immediately resorted to his arts, becoming first a fire, then a flood, then a horrible wild beast, in rapid succession. But finding all would not do, he at last resumed his own form and addressed the youth in angry accents. "'Who are you, bold youth, who thus invade my abode, and what do you want of me?' Aristaeus replied, Proteus, you know already, for it is needless for any one to attempt to deceive you, and do you also cease your efforts to elude me. I am led hither by divine assistance to know from you the cause of my misfortune and how to remedy it. At these words the prophet fixing on him his grey eyes with a piercing look thus spoke. You received the merited reward of your deeds by which Eurydice met her death, for in flying from you she trod upon a serpent of whose bite she died to avenge her death the nymphs her companions have sent this destruction to your bees you have to appease their anger and thus it must be done select four bulls of perfect form and size and four cows of equal beauty build four altars to the nymphs and sacrifice the animals leaving their carcasses in the leafy grove to orpheus and eurydice you shall pay such funeral honours as may allay their resentment returning after nine days you will examine the bodies of the cattle slain and see what will befall Aristaeus faithfully obeyed these directions. He sacrificed the cattle. He left their bodies in the grove. He offered funeral honors to the shades of Orpheus and Eurydice. Then returning on the ninth day, he examined the bodies of the animals, and wonderful to relate, a swarm of bees had taken possession of one of the carcasses and were pursuing their labors there as in a hive. In the task, Cowper alludes to the story of Aristaeus when speaking of the ice palace built by the Empress Anne of Russia. He had been describing the fantastic forms which ice assumes in connection with waterfalls, etc. Less worthy of applause, though more admired, because a novelty the work of man, imperial mistress of the fur-clad Russ, they, thy most magnificent and mighty freak, the wonder of the north, no forest fell, when thou wouldst build, no quarry sent its stores, to enrich thy walls, but thou didst hew the floods, and make the marble of the glassy wave, in such a place palace Aristaeus found Cyrene, when he bore the plaintive tale of his lost bees to her maternal ear. Milton also appears to have had Cyrene in her domestic scene in his mind when he described to us Sabrina, the nymph of the river Severn, in the guardian spirit's song in Comus. Sabrina fair, listen where thou art sitting under the classy, cool, translucent wave, in twisted braids of lilies knitting, the loose train of thy amber dropping hair. Listen for dear honour's sake, goddess of the silver lake, listen and save. The following are other celebrated mythical poets and musicians, some of whom were hardly inferior to Orpheus himself. Amphion Amphion was the son of Jupiter and Antiope, queen of Thebes. With his twin brother Zethus, he was exposed at birth on Mount Cithuron, where they grew up among the shepherds, not knowing their parentage. Mercury gave Amphion a lyre and taught him to play upon it, and his brother occupied himself in hunting and tenting the flocks. Meanwhile Antiope, their mother, who had been treated with great cruelty by Lycus, the usurping king of Thebes, and by Dirce, his wife, found means to inform her children of their rights and to summon them to her assistance. With a band of their fellow herdsmen they attacked and slew Lycus, and tying Dirce by the hair of her head to a bull, let him drag her till she was dead. Amphion, having become king of Thebes, fortified the city with a wall. It is said that when he played on his lyre, the stones moved of their own accord and took their places in the wall. See Tennyson's poem of Amphion for an amusing use made of this story. Linus Linus was the instructor of Hercules in music, but having one day reproved his pupil rather harshly, he roused the anger of Hercules, who struck him with his lyre and killed him. The Myris an ancient Thracian bard, who in his presumption challenged the muses to a trial of skill, and being overcome in the contest was deprived by them of his sight. Milton alludes to him with other blind bards when speaking of his own blindness. Paradise Lost, Book Three. Marseus. Minerva invented the flute, and played upon it to the delight of all the celestial auditors. But the mischievous urchin Cupid, having dared to laugh at the queer face which the goddess made while playing, Minerva threw the instrument indignantly away, and it fell down to earth and was found by Marseus. He blew upon it and drew from it such ravishing sounds that he was tempted to challenge Apollo himself to a musical contest. The god, of course, triumphed, and punished Marseus by flaying him alive. Melampus Melampus was the first mortal endowed with prophetic powers. Before his house there stood an oak tree containing a serpent's nest. The old serpents were killed by the servants, but Melampus took care of the young ones and fed them carefully. One day, when he was asleep under the oak, the serpents licked his ears with their tongues. 
On awaking he was astonished to find that he now understood the language of birds and creeping things. This knowledge enabled him to foretell future events, and he became a renowned soothsayer. At one time his enemies took him captive and kept him secretly imprisoned. Melampus in the silence of the night heard the word-worms in the timbers talking together, and found out by what they said that the timbers were nearly eaten through and the roof would soon fall in. He told his captors and demanded to be let out, warning them also. They took his warning and thus escaped destruction, and rewarded Melampus and held him in high honor. Musaeus, a semi-mythological personage who was represented by one tradition to be the son of Orpheus. He is said to have written sacred poems and oracles. Milton couples his name with that of Orpheus in his Il Pinceraso. But, O oh, sad virgin, that thy power might raise Musaeus from his bower, or bid the soul of Orpheus sing such notes as warbled to the string, drew iron tears down Pluto's cheek, and made hell grant what love did seek. End of chapter 24This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Clarica. Bullfinch's Mythology, The Age of Fable by Thomas Bullfinch. Chapter 25. Arian, Ibicus, Simonides, Sappho. The poets whose adventures compose this chapter were real persons some of whose works yet remain, and their influence on poets who succeeded them is yet more important than their poetical remains. The adventures recorded of them in the following stories rest on the same authority as other narratives of the age of fable, that is, of the poets who have told them. In their present form the first two are translated from the German, Arian from Schlegel, and Ibicus from Schiller. Arian. Arian was a famous musician, and dwelt in the court of Periander, king of Corinth, with whom he was a great favorite. There was to be a musical contest in Sicily, and Arian longed to compete for the prize. He told his wish to Periander, who besought him like a brother to give up the thought. "'Pray stay with me,' he said, and be contented. He who strives to win may lose. Arian answered, a wandering life best suits the free heart of a poet. The talent which a god bestowed on me I would fain make a source of pleasure to others. And if I win the prize, how will the enjoyment of it be increased by the consciousness of my widespread fame? He went out, won the prize, and embarked with his wealth in a Corinthian ship for home. On the second morning after setting sail, the wind breathed mild and fair. O oh, Periander, he exclaimed, dismiss your fears. Soon shall you forget them in my embrace. With what lavish offerings will we display our gratitude to the gods, and how merry will we be at the festal board! The wind and sea continued propitious. Not a cloud dimmed the firmament. He had not trusted too much to the ocean, but he had to man. He overheard the seamen exchanging hints with one another, and found they were plotting to possess themselves of his treasure. Presently they surrounded him loud and mutinous, and said, Arian, you must die. If you would have a grave on shore, yield yourself to die on this spot, but if otherwise, cast yourself into the sea. Will nothing satisfy you but my life? said he. Take my gold and welcome. I willingly buy my life at that price. No, we cannot spare you. Your life would be too dangerous to us. Where could we go to escape from Periander, if he should know that you had been robbed by us? Your gold would be of little use to us, if, on returning home, we could never more be free from fear. Grant me, then, said he, a last request, since naught will avail to save my life, that I may die as I have lived, as becomes a bard. When I shall have sung my death-song, and my harp-strings shall have ceased to vibrate, then I will bid farewell to life, and yield uncomplaining to my fate. This prayer, like the others, would have been unheeded. They thought only of their booty. But to hear so famous a musician, that moved their rude hearts. Suffer me, he added, to arrange my dress. Apollo will not favor me unless I be clad in my minstrel garb. He clothed his well-proportioned limbs in gold and purple fair to see. His tunic fell around him in graceful folds, 
jewels adorned his arms, his brow was crowned with a golden wreath, and over his neck and shoulders flowed his hair perfumed with odors. His left hand held the lyre, his right the ivory wand with which he struck its chords. Like one inspired, he seemed to drink the morning air and glitter in the morning ray. The seamen gazed with admiration. He strode forward to the vessel's side and looked down into the deep blue sea. Addressing his lyre, he sang, Companion of my voice, come with me to the realm of shades. Though Cerberus may growl, we know the power of song can tame his rage. Ye heroes of Elysium, who have passed the darkling flood, ye happy souls, soon shall I join your band. Yet can ye relieve my grief? Alas, I leave my friend behind me. Thou, who didst find thy Eurydice, and lose her again as soon as found, when she had vanished like a dream, how didst thou hate the cheerful light? I must away, but I will not fear. The gods look down upon us. Ye who slay me unoffending, when I am no more, your time of trembling shall come. Ye Nereids, receive your guest, who throws himself upon your mercy. So saying, he sprang into the deep sea. The waves covered him, and the seamen held on their way, fancying themselves safe from all danger of detection. But the strains of his music had drawn round him the inhabitants of the deep to listen, and dolphins followed the ship as if chained by a spell. While he struggled in the waves, a dolphin offered him his back, and carried him mounted thereon safe to shore. At the spot where he landed, a monument of brass was afterwards erected upon the rocky shore to preserve the memory of the event. When Arian and the dolphin parted, each to his own element, Arian thus poured forth his thanks. Farewell, thou faithful, friendly fish, would that I could reward thee. But thou canst not wend with me, nor I with thee. Companionship we may not have. May Galatia, queen of the deep, accord thee her favor, and thou, proud of the burden, draw her chariot over the smooth mirror of the deep. Arian hastened from the shore, and soon saw before him the towers of Corinth. He journeyed on, harp in hand, singing as he went, full of love and happiness, forgetting his losses, and mindful only of what remained, his friend and his lyre. He entered the hospitable halls, and was soon clasped in the embrace of Periander. "'I come back to thee, my friend,' he said. "'The talent which a god bestowed has been the delight of thousands, but false knaves have stripped me of my well-earned treasure, yet I retain the consciousness of widespread fame.' Then he told Periander all the wonderful events that had befallen him, who heard him with amazement. "'Shall such wickedness triumph?' said he. "'Then in vain is power lodged in my hands.' That we may discover the criminals, you must remain here in concealment, and so they will approach without suspicion. When the ship arrived in the harbor, he summoned the mariners before him. "'Have you heard anything of Arian?' he inquired. "'I anxiously look for his return.' They replied, "'We left him well and prosperous in Tarentum.' As they said these words, Arian stepped forth and faced them. His well-proportioned limbs were arrayed in gold and purple fair to see. His tunic fell around him in graceful folds. Jewels adorned his arms. His brow was crowned with a golden wreath, and over his neck and shoulders flowed his hair perfumed with odors. His left hand held the lyre, his right the ivory wand with which he struck its chords. They fell prostrate at his feet, as if a lightning bolt had struck them. We meant to murder him, and he has become a god. O oh, earth, open and receive us! Then Periander spoke, He lives, the master of the lay. Kind heaven protects the poet's life. As for you, I invoke not the spirit of vengeance. Arian wishes not your blood. Ye slaves of avarice, be gone. Seek some barbarous land, and never may aught beautiful delight your souls. Spencer represents Arian, mounted on his dolphin, accompanying the train of Neptune and Amphitrite. Then was there heard a most celestial sound, of dainty music which did next ensue, and on the floating waters as enthroned, Arian with his harp unto him drew, the ears and hearts of all that goodly crew, even when as yet the dolphin which him bore, through the Aegean seas from pirates' view, stood still by him astonished at his lore, and all the raging seas for joy forgot to roar. Byron, in his Child Herald, Canto II, alludes to the story of Arian when, describing his voyage, he represents one of the seamen making music to entertain the rest. 
The moon is up, by heaven a lovely eve. Long streams of light o'er dancing waves expand. Now lads on shore may sigh, and maids believe such be our fate when we return to land. Meantime some rude Arian's restless hand wakes the brisk harmony that sailors love. A circle there of merry listeners stand, or to some well-known measure featly move, thoughtless as if on shore they were still free to rove. Ibicus. In order to understand the story of Ibicus, which follows, it is necessary to remember, first, that the theatres of the ancients were immense fabrics capable of containing from ten to thirty thousand spectators, and as they were used only on festival occasions and admission was free to all, they were usually filled. They were without roofs and open to the sky, and the performances were in the daytime. Secondly, the appalling representation of the Furies is not exaggerated in the story. It is recorded that Aeschylus, the tragic poet, having on one occasion represented the Furies in a chorus of fifty performers, the terror of the spectators was such that many fainted and were thrown into convulsions, and the magistrates forbade a like representation for the future. Ibicus, the pious poet, was on his way to the chariot races and musical competitions held at the Isthmus of Corinth, which attracted all of Grecian lineage. Apollo had bestowed on him the gift of song, the honeyed lips of the poet, and he pursued his way with lightsome step full of the god. Already the towers of Corinth crowning the height appeared in view, and he had entered with pious awe the sacred grove of Neptune. No living object was in sight, only a flock of cranes flew overhead, taking the same course as himself in their migration to a southern clime. "'Good luck to you, ye friendly squadrons!' he exclaimed. "'My companions from across the sea, I take your company for a good omen. We come from far and fly in search of hospitality. May both of us meet that kind of reception which shields the stranger guest from harm.' He paced briskly on, and soon was in the middle of the wood. There suddenly, at a narrow pass, two robbers stepped forth and barred his way. He must yield or fight. But his hand, accustomed to the lyre, and not to the strife of arms, sank powerless. He called for help on men and gods, but his cry reached no defender's ear. Then here must I die, said he, in a strange land, unlamented, cut off by the hand of outlaws, and see none to avenge my cause. Sore wounded, he sank to the earth, when hoarse screamed the cranes overhead. "'Take up my cause, ye cranes,' he said, "'since no voice but yours answers to my cry.' So saying, he closed his eyes in death. The body, despoiled and mangled, was found, and though disfigured with wounds, was recognized by the friend in Corinth, who had expected him as a guest. "'Is it thus I find you restored to me?' he exclaimed. I, who hope to entwine your temples with the wreath of triumph in the strife of song. The guests assembled at the festival heard the tidings with dismay. All Greece felt the wound, every heart owned its loss. They crowded round the tribunal of the magistrates and demanded vengeance on the murderers and expiation with their blood. But what tracer mark shall point out the perpetrator from amidst the vast multitude attracted by the splendor of the feast? Did he fall by the hands of robbers, or did some private enemy slay him? The all-discerning sun alone can tell, for no other eye beheld it. Yet not improbably the murderer even now walks in the midst of the throng and enjoys the fruits of his crime, while vengeance seeks for him in vain. Perhaps in their own temple's enclosure he defies the gods, mingling freely in this throng of men that now presses into the amphitheatre. For now crowded together, row on row, the multitude fill the seats, till it seems as if the very fabric would give way. The murmur of voices sounds like the roar of the sea, while the circles widening in their ascent rise tier on tier, as if they would reach the sky. And now the vast assemblage listens to the awful voice of the chorus personating the Furies, which in solemn guise advances with measured step, and moves around the circuit of the theatre. Can they be mortal women who compose that awful group, and can that vast concourse of silent forms be living beings? The choristers, clad in black, bore in their fleshless hands torches blazing with a pitchy flame. Their cheeks were bloodless, and in the place of hair, writhing and swelling serpents curled around their brows. 
Forming a circle, these awful beings sang their hymns, rending the hearts of the guilty and enchaining all their faculties. It rose and swelled, overpowering the sound of the instruments, stealing the judgment, palsying the heart, curdling the blood. Happy the man who keeps his heart pure from guilt and crime. Him we avengers touch not, he treads the path of life secure from us. But woe, woe to him who has done the deed of secret murder. We the fearful family of night fasten ourselves upon his whole being. Thinks he by flight to escape us? We fly still faster in pursuit, twine our snakes around his feet, and bring him to the ground. Unwearied we pursue, no pity checks our course, still on and on, to the end of life, we give him no peace nor rest. Thus the humanity sang and moved in solemn cadence, while stillness like the stillness of death sat over the whole assembly, as if in the presence of superhuman beings. And then in solemn march, completing the circuit of the theatre, they passed out at the back of the stage. Every heart fluttered between illusion and reality, and every breast panted with undefined terror, quailing before the awful power that watches secret crimes and winds unseen the skein of destiny. At that moment a cry burst forth from one of the uppermost benches. "'Look, look, comrade, yonder are the cranes of Ibycus!' and suddenly there appeared sailing across the sky a dark object, which a moment's inspection showed to be a flock of cranes flying directly over the theatre. Of Ibycus, did he say? The beloved name revived the sorrow in every breast. As wave follows waves over the face of the sea, so ran from mouth to mouth the words, Of Ibycus, him whom we all lament, whom some murderer's hand laid low, what have the cranes to do with him? and louder grew the swell of voices, while like a lightning's flash the thought sped through every heart. Observe the power of the Eumenides. The pious poet shall be avenged, the murderer has informed against himself. Seize the man who uttered that cry, and the other to whom he spoke. The culprit would gladly have recalled his words, but it was too late. The faces of the murderers, pale with terror, betrayed their guilt. The people took them before the judge, they confessed their crime, and suffered the punishment they deserved. Simonides Simonides was one of the most prolific of the early poets of Greece, but only a few fragments of his compositions have descended to us. He wrote hymns, triumphal odes, and elegies. In the last species of composition he particularly excelled. His genius was inclined to the pathetic, and none could touch with truer effect the chords of human sympathy. The lamentation of Denai, the most important of the fragments which remain of his poetry, is based on the tradition that Denai and her infant son were confined by the order of her father, Acrisius, in a chest and set adrift on the sea. The chest floated towards the island of Seraphis, where both were rescued by Dictus, a fisherman, and carried to Polydectes, king of the country, who received and protected them. The child, Perseus, when grown up, became a famous hero, whose adventures have been recorded in a previous chapter. Simonides passed much of his life at the courts of princes, and often employed his talents in panegyric and festal odes, receiving his reward from the munificence of those whose exploits he celebrated. This employment was not derogatory, but closely resembles that of the earliest bards, such as Demodocus, described by Homer, or of Homer himself, as recorded by tradition. On one occasion, when residing at the court of Scopus, king of Thessaly, the prince desired him to prepare a poem in celebration of his exploits, to be recited at a banquet. In order to diversify his theme, Simonides, who was celebrated for his piety, introduced into his poem the exploits of Castor and Pollux. Such digressions were not unusual with the poets on similar occasions, and one might suppose an ordinary mortal might have been content to share the praises of the sons of Leda. But vanity is exacting, and as Scopus sat at his festal board among his courtiers and sycophants, he grudged every verse that did not rehearse his own praises. When Simonides approached to receive the promised reward, Scopus bestowed but half the expected sum, saying, Here's payment for my portion of thy performance. Castor and Pollux will doubtless compensate thee for so much as relates to them. 
The disconcerted poet returned to his seat amidst the laughter which followed the great man's jest. In a little time he received a message that two young men on horseback were waiting without and anxious to see him. Simonides hastened to the door, but looked in vain for the visitors. Scarcely, however, had he left the banqueting hall, when the roof fell in with a loud crash, burying Scopus and all his guests beneath the ruins. On inquiring as to the appearance of the young men who had sent for him, Simonides was satisfied that they were no other than Castor and Pollux themselves. Sappho Sappho was a poetess who flourished in a very early age of Greek literature. Of her works few fragments remain, but they are enough to establish her claim to eminent poetical genius. The story of Sappho commonly alluded to is that she was passionately in love with a beautiful youth named Phaon, and failing to obtain a return of affection, she threw herself from the promontory of Leucadia into the sea, under a superstition that those who should take that lover's leap would, if not destroyed, be cured of their love. Byron alludes to the story of Sappho in Child Harold, Canto Two. Child Harold sailed and passed the barren spot, where sad Penelope o'erlooked the wave, and onward viewed the mount, not yet forgot, the lover's refuge and the lesbian's grave. Dark Sappho could not verse immortal save, that breast imbued with such immortal fire. Twas on a Grecian autumn's gentle eve, child Harold hayed Leucadia's cape afar, etc. Those who wish to know more of Sappho and her leap are referred to the spectator, numbers 223 and 229. See also Moore's Evenings in Greece. End of chapter 25